I also hope at the end of even this short talk, you will feel you have a lot to learn. I would like to encourage you to learn some of the ideas here. Uh, in fact, if you uh, email me with the keyword book, I will send you my 500 page book and you can start learning competitive engineering. Digital. Tom at yoga.com. Free offer. Okay, if you didn't catch that, you don't deserve the book. You're not quick enough. Okay, there's the email, right? Okay, so uh, here's the basic idea Tom at gil, G I L B dot com. Simple, huh? Website. You can guess what the website is. Yeah. Okay, so main idea here is quality assurance is far more than testing. Far more. In fact, it is so much more that we could drop the testing and we would still have plenty of quality assurance. Testing is not an essential idea. It may be a nice supplementary idea for some purposes, but it is not an essential idea. And I'm also going to say it is not the best idea. That is, it is not the ideas which are most effective in getting quality. And they are also not the most cost effective or efficient, not the most value for money. Okay, so we're actually doing a pretty dumb thing. We're using an ineffective method at great cost, but we could be using more effective methods at less cost. But if you don't know what those other methods are, it's difficult to start using them. So I'm going to at least give you a list of some of the other methods, give you uh, ways of reading up on getting the facts and other sources for them. Okay. So, um, this is, yeah. Uh, I'd like to meet an old friend of mine, uh, and he spent his life collecting data on testing. You want facts about testing? Go to papers. On my website, remember the website? You will find about 10 free downloads, slides and papers from Capers to get the facts and figures about testing. If you like, you can buy his books. Okay. He has an enormous database for 15,000 or so companies uh, explaining how effective is different forms of testing. Okay. We're going to take a look at some of his uh, data right now. Okay, so I guess everybody here has some idea of what regression testing is. Now, question. How effective is regression testing at detecting bugs? If there are 100 bugs to be found, how many bugs do you get with regression testing on average, historically? Anybody like to guess? Okay, 10%. Did I hear zero or something? <laughs> Any other numbers than 10%? Yes? 20. 20. Nobody guessing 42 yet? Okay. Now, here is the range that Cambridge Jones has observed in many companies. 15, so not bad, 10, lowest. The, now, by the way, the only companies reporting are companies that are qualified and well organized enough to even make a report. So the really bad ones aren't even in this sample. The ones at 5% or these are reasonably well qualified companies, and uh, at maximum 30%. So, so 70% of the bugs that are there during regression testing will not normally be found by any form of regression testing, which is very expensive. I remember uh, Hewlett Packard once told me that uh, to do regression testing for one change for printer software cost them six weeks. So it can be very expensive, depending on how you do it. Well, but what about integration testing? We've now integrated something, and uh, we're going to test the integration, which is the big problem. Where always integration is always been the classical problem. But, uh, nobody had understood the interface as well enough. Oh, what do you think the percentage defect finding ability for integration testing is historically? Any guesses? Yeah, very. How many do you find of 100? 15 first. 15. 15. Oh. No, no, upper end is 40 percent. Not maybe one finds 50 by some. Okay. But the, you know the range of reported from thousands of industrial companies, 25 to 40. Now you can see for where I'm going to this. I'm trying to make the point that 
testing is not really very effective. Okay? If you have 100 bugs and you find 25, 75 are escaping. And then people say, we have 75 bugs. Why did you spend six weeks testing? Didn't you do anything? You know, so they have a right to ask. If you have so many bugs, what's the point of all that testing? You know? And they don't know the difference between 75 and 100 bucks. Because one bug is one bug too many. So here is a range of different classes of tests. Notice the most effective test is high volume beta testing with more than 1,000 clients, 60 to 85. So the upper end of any known form of testing is 85%. In other words, 15% will always escape no matter what you do if you're using testing. Find the bugs. That's how bad we are. We ought to know it. Maybe ought to warn other people. These are the limits of our technology. There is nobody does it better. Don't say we are bad. If we're at 85 percent, we're good. We're at the upper end of the state of the art. Don't say, don't say you didn't find those 15 percent. You said, of course not. Nobody knows how to do it. If you know, tell me. If you don't, shut up. Okay. Now, there's another method known as static testing, but also more well known as software inspection. I wrote a book about it in 1993. Dorothy Graham, also a testing specialist, still can be bought. <laughs> now, but, so inspections are a form of test. They're a form of looking for bugs. I'm simplifying. You're looking for more than bugs. You're looking for all kinds of problems. Yes? Some kind of contracting? Some kind of yeah, exactly. There's another name is code review. However, we make a very sharp distinction between code review and code inspections. Code inspection, the moment you use the word inspections, there's a lot more formal data collection and engineering management. Review is just some programmer staring at the code saying, aha. Okay? The, the, so uh, here are the numbers. You see, here is code review and code inspection. Code review is 20 to 35 percent uh, effective. This uh, using data and feedback and learning engineering mechanisms is far more effective, but it's still not effective enough. <laughs> Even the best we have. Okay. Now the inspections and code book inspections have been with us since about 1970s, 45 years. It's an old history. And uh, reviews even earlier, probably since the first code was written, some other person read some other person's code. Okay. And by the way, you can do reviews and inspections at a higher level than the code. Uh, it says design, but that means anything that is input to the coder, like requirements for design of any kind. And uh, fi finding defects early at that stage is very smart. It's about ten times smarter than doing it later, because. Uh, uh, defects at that stage explode and cost more as you move downstream. Well, this is pretty bad. So dynamic testing, the ordinary kind, bad. Inspection, static testing, also bad. In fact, these are old, uh, inspections are better than testing for one reason. You find the defects earlier and the cost of repair is about 10 times less. Otherwise, they're equally ineffective. But inspection is ineffective early, and that has always paid off. It's always been the case for inspection. Now, if this symbolically is all the defects, your universe of defects that you would not like to have, I believe that the smartest way to attack the defect problem is to design or architect so that you do not have the defects. I'll give a very simple example. If you have a choice, some software which has been running for years and has no failure, no failure rates or bugs. And then you have a choice of some guys who write some new software. <laughs> if you make the design decision to reuse the software with no bugs in it, <laughs> if they had designed the wall so the sound wouldn't get through, it wouldn't have the problem. So now we have detected it at a late stage after the building is built, which is a bit too late. Okay. Now, so I'm going to argue that there's a saying, you do not get quality by testing it in. You've heard this, right? You get quality by 
designing it did. This is, every engineer knows this. Maybe not the software engineers. How many people say, I know that you get quality by designing it in? Hmm, a few hats going up. Okay. Also, you can design things in, but you can also do something we call defect prevention. This means you prevent the bug from happening by giving, say, the programmer more information, more training, more support. See? And you prevent more high quality inputs from requirements. Then you can prevent the defect from getting in there. Okay, so that's another approach I'm going to be talking about. Then we have the inspection method, which is superior to testing, not in effectiveness, but in being early and therefore giving you lower cost of correction, more time, less money to do it. So these are some of the alternatives. All of these are quality assurance alternatives. So if you have a chief technical officer saying, I want to assure quality, okay, and you say, ah, no problem, I will test. But I'd like somebody to say, well, there is a broader way of attacking the problem. Maybe some testing, but why don't we do the more cost-effective things first? Then we'll see what role testing has to play. Now, Cambridge Jones does an interesting thought experiment because the different forms of inspection and test can be done in a serial manner, one after the other. Okay? Like a set of fishing nets catching more and more fish as they go through. So he does the following, well, in this diagram, uh, there's always some defects remaining. My friend Gerald Weinberg had a wonderful way of putting it. When you think you have found the last bug, how many more remain? And the answer is always at least one more. If you think you got them all, you don't, you don't know how to measure or sense them, or you're a bit optimistic, or very young, or something like that. There's at least one. There's no such thing as pure, guaranteed, forever, zero defect software. Everybody would like it, nobody knows quite how to prove that it's there. So Capers does the following experiment. It says, if you choose between eight and 10 different stages of inspection or review, followed by different stages of testing, the maximum effect you can get is 95%. So if you have 100 bugs, five will escape. Even this. In other words, there is no hope of getting zero defect from any known combination, even at the state of the art limits the best for all of them using eight or 10 forms of static testing called inspection or dynamic testing, which we normally just call testing. In other words, if your organization demands zero defects because a bug could kill people in an aircraft or something like that, <laughs> or a train, then uh, uh, no form of testing or inspection is good enough to get that. There must use other methods to assure that even this reliability quality, bug trees in there, not to mention all the other qualities. Um, one of the reasons for the range is, uh, of, of uh, you know, 20 to 35 percent is that you start off practicing something, but you, your culture can systematically improve. And so you get better and better moving from the low end of capability to the high end of capability if you're really trying to improve. That's, uh, so if we just use tests and use the numbers of capers, then in the long term, you know, uh, the errors that get to the field that escape from tests are uh, given by this uh, curve. Now, if we add inspection before, uh, inspection to the design, the requirements, the code, even the user manuals, and filter out a lot of the problems and defects early, then the defects that get to test will be much fewer. Uh, you'll still have the same percentage finding what remains, and you still won't find everything. There will still be some in the field. But you will have much lower cost. This is 10 times cheaper, thing, and faster, cheaper. You will remove those bugs, at least. Okay. This is very well recorded. If you Google inspection experiences or data, you find hundreds of papers and research proving this point. But Capers Jones has maybe the most solid database. Uh, proving these ideas. 
Now, if we take one more stage of maturity and we go for what is known as defect prevention, you know, let me, there's a thing called the defect prevention process. Originally, it is identical with capability maturity model level five. Make a long story short. It's a process developed by Robert Bates and Linda Jones of IBM Research Triangle Park at about 1980. And basically, they don't prevent, defect prevention doesn't mean you find them and fix them before they go on. Many people misunderstand the word prevention. You prevent them ever happening. They just don't happen. That's prevention. Okay? It's not detection and correction. It is the, the error by the programmer or the, even the requirements writer is not made. Now, we know the, the data from this, and it starts about 45% and goes up to, say, 60, 70%. So if you plug this process in, uh, you will prevent the vast majority of, let me call them bugs. Fact is, you're attacking a much broader front than just bugs, but let me call them bugs. And then what is left will happen. It will be in the code, it will be in the test, test scripts and test plans, and you can use inspection to get those early, 10 times lower costs than if they surface in normal testing. And what you don't get in inspection, you will hopefully get some of them in tests, but there will always remain some that escape to the field. Okay, so you're getting a little pattern of how you might mature. Uh, first, you need to move these towards the state of the art, maybe through several years. Then you need to add in processes like this. This, this can take several years, this transition, but you're getting a more mature quality assurance. So here, you are assuring, here you are assuring quality by preventing bad things happening. Here you are assuring quality by capturing bad things early. Here you are capturing before you go to the customer in the field. Okay, different aspects. But these are very well developed disciplines for decades before you were born, most of you, right? I figured out maybe I'm the oldest guy in the room. I'm 72. Anybody beat me? Uh, but I am your historian. I remember effective things that other people have forgotten. So I'm here to remind you of them. Okay. Now, looking at the design quality in I mean, this is just symbolic for, you know, that motor was not made by taking a very bad motor and patching it. And finding bugs. That motor was clearly made by good mechanical motor engineering design, as almost anything we see around us. Okay. Um, here, uh, if you take an old car in probably Cuba and uh, keep on repairing it, does it become a new Tesla S? That's my new car coming in December. Can't wait. Okay. Uh, in Norway, we have a fantastic deal. On the electrical car, no taxes whatsoever, forever. Same here, it's, not, it's true. <laughs> oh, I didn't know any other countries did this. There's a, a rebate of seven to fifteen thousand dollars in the U.S., and Norway has eliminated all taxes to encourage the green revolution of cars. So it's a fantastic deal. So the second best selling car in the whole of Norway is the Tesla S. And Norway is the second biggest market in the world after the U.S. for Tesla, which is interesting. Maybe not the third biggest market. Okay, interesting. But the, the Tesla is designed from the ground up with revolutionary principles, like the safest car they've ever tested. It scores 99 out of 100 points in consumer reports. Nobody's ever scored higher. It's not done by getting bugs out of an old Ford. It is done by designing from the ground up. It's quite amazing stuff. Okay, now here's my little model uh, of qualities. Um, for any object you like, whether it be software or hardware or combinations, there are a number of quality aspects. And just for example, reliability, performance, security, usability, maintainability, okay? And all of these have the characteristics symbolized by the arrow of being variable more or less usability, more or less security. Okay? Now, real engineering, what I'm here to do is to encourage you to be more software engineers 
or even test or quality assurance engineers and less testers and coders move up one level to real engineering that the rest of the world understands and almost everything else. And this means we're going to have to quantify how much security we want. Go to my website and read a paper called Quantifying Security. We need to quantify how much user friendliness we want. Set it as an engineering target. Want to know how to do that? Download chapter five from my website of the competitive engineering book scales of measure. Exactly how to quantify the visibility is in there. We've been doing it for decades. So we, in other words, engineering means we quantify how good we want to be. Then we hand the quantification, which is a quality requirement, this multi-dimensional quality requirements. To an architect or design engineer and say, design me something that will meet these quality requirements. That's called engineering. And by the way, we don't have unlimited time and unlimited budget, so it has to be done in a year. It cannot cost more than the consumer will pay, and so you must design within the constraints I give you. And good engineers feel that's an interesting challenge. Find the designs or architectures that get us to nice levels of qualities within any given constraints. That's real engineering. Now, by the way, how many people here do something like that? The engineer quality is not, not person, but at your company, somebody does it, right? Very interesting. This is to software? Uh, firmware, okay. Uh, because there is a culture called real engineering, which does this. And, and, and this is what I mean by designing quality in. You set numeric targets, give it to real engineers, and they know the technologies that will get us to these levels within these costs. They plug them in, try them out, and if it works, the design works. It? Okay, here's a simple example of setting a quality goal. For example, uh, we want to, to have a goal to have a kind of usability called learning ability. We set up a scale of measure, the average time to learn how to operate a computer from before they have any training until they are at work and have to do a job. And today it takes three hours. But we have a very dramatic improvement we want. We want to go down to 10 minutes, okay, which is 18 times faster. Now we have a clear idea of one quality. Now we hand it to the designer and said, okay, uh, the current architecture and design of today's products is at this level. Make it 18 times better by design. And good engineers will find solutions. The most fun is to go order of magnitude better. The wonderful, fun challenge for engineers. But by the way, I should ask, how many people here have a, a university or technical college degree in something called engineering, not software engineering, it doesn't count, in engineering of any other kind? One, two, three, four, five, another one. See, okay then hopefully you know what engineering is. But I find that programmers and testers without this education have no understanding of it. Uh, they understand coding. I am a coder. I'm a Java coder, or whatever it is. Ruby on Rails is better. But these are not engineers. They sometimes call themselves software engineers. They couldn't even define the meaning of the word engineering, I find. OK. Here's a, uh, here's a, uh, a tool I have uh, invented called impact estimation. And it's quite complex, and given the short talk, I'm not going to attempt to explain it in detail. However, it's in the free book I offered you in the chapter called Impact Estimation. But it uh, looks like this. Here are symbolically three quantified um, objectives for quality. Here's some notion of cost. Those were those arrows I showed you in the previous slide. Here are some uh, detailed design ideas. And here are some numbers indicating how good we estimate the design ideas will be for this quality, that quality, that quality, and how much they will cost. Take this as a simple symbol of what I mean when I say engineering. Okay, it's quantified thinking. We have quantified the requirements. We don't just wave our arms and say it should be very user-friendly and be very stylish. That's called data poetry, or management bullshit is another word. Uh, real engineering starts with extremely clear engineering ideas and targets. Nothing new in the engineering and science business at all. Nothing new in good management at all. Okay, but we, we don't quite have a real engineering culture in software. 
Yeah. And then, uh, these are all kinds of design ideas, and if it, we have to be able to say for any one design idea, uh, you know, that uh, this will give us 29% of the improvement in reliability that we want, and it will give us nothing in the style area. Okay? So what we're doing, we're scoring designs in multiple dimensions of quality and cost, so we understand their total impact in multiple qualities, not just bugs. Reliability is a vague custom of buggies, but real engineers don't talk about bugs, they talk about mean time between failure, as you engineers know. Okay? It's amazing we don't even have this normal engineering concept for software, mean time between failure, we still are talking about bugs. There's a very bad relationship between bugs and mean time between failure. And if you don't understand that, you're nowhere near thinking about becoming a real engineer. So, uh, uh, partly I'm summing up the main part of the talk, partly I'm going to peek and see how much time I have left, which is about 14 minutes. And maybe you can uh, then give some more detail. In, uh, okay, so uh, the first idea is quality is far more than bugs. It's any number of quality. Normally, in any project I do, the first day, I ask the people who are putting the money on the table, the budget, what do you most want of all? And they'll say something like more productivity for my staff. Okay, but if you get the more productivity for your staff, what else do you want? Oh, I'd like a more reliable system so you know, I can trust it. Then. Okay, and after that, well, I'd like a more secure system. And then make a list. Seven out of ten things on the list, I call these the top ten most important things are qualities. Two or three of them will be cost reduction or performance increase, but the rest will be security, usability, adaptability, productivity, illities, also known as qualities. Also known as, the general definition of quality is how well the function performs. How secure is it? How user-friendly is it? How maintainable is it? So, that's the idea of quality is how well, which is different from other uh, requirements or targets, you might say. Here are some uh, very traditional and common entities, and here is the notion of their subsets of breaking them down into uh, different qualities. Again, the free download called Chapter 5 of the Competitive Engineering Book on the website gives details of exactly how to quantify all of these, in case you wonder. Uh, read it and read. How many people say, I know how to quantify security, and we do it? Uh -huh. Oh, hands. How many people say, I, I know how to quantify usability, and we do it in our projects? Ah, good, two of hands. Okay. So, uh, we're getting there, we just start. <laughs> um, this man, Lord Kelvin, I sometimes say, would you like to hear the words from the Lord? Lord Kelvin, anyway. William Thompson, President of the Royal Society. Kelvin scale of measure of temperature, remember this is. This changed my life, but he wrote it in 1893. I often say that when you can measure what you are speaking about, by the way, measure is a synonym for test. Test measures. When you can measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, this is also known as to quantify. You know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, and you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is bad. And I'm not my text. That changed my life. I read that when I was 25 years old, about 1965. And I applied that test to everything in programming and testing I was working with, and I found that some people know what they're talking about, and most people do not. And they don't even know that they don't know what they're talking about. That's really bad. Knowing what you don't know. Uh, here's a man I've met at several conferences, uh, James Whitaker. How many people know anything about James Whitaker? This, uh, this, okay, one. Uh, he's got some books out. Uh, he has uh, blogs. He has websites. You please do look him up. But uh, here's, here's the deal. He has gone in this direction. He has totally eliminated having any professional testers on his staff. 
he gets the quality in by a variety of other tactics, but no professional testing or test processes on his staff. Now, how he does it doesn't matter. He's thinking in parallel with me, in different ways. But he, uh, he, he's done it, and he's documented it. Huh? And he's done it both at Google primarily, but he's moved back to Microsoft. So it's a man worth following, uh, who's a professional, you know, uh, uh, who's really understood that there are smarter ways of getting quality for Google to Microsoft than testing. He starts off and saying, it's too expensive, it's too, it's, it's ineffective, there must be a better way, and he searches for all the better ways, continual process improvement, building in one idea after the other, and making it work. So well worth a study. Well worth inviting to your conferences in Latvia to the game over. Okay, really interesting. So uh, winding down, I have 10 minutes or nine, a uh, little bit more about some of these methods. The first, uh, I actually hold a, uh, it's between one and three day course. One day is at conferences and three days at the British Computer Society for free in London, by the way. There are lots of free courses in London you can probably get that. Uh, one coming up two weeks from now on project management, three days. Okay. Go to the British Computer Society, specialist group on quality find a free course. Then the cheap Brian Air ticket, stay with a friend from Latvia, and you get the free course. Then you go into some detail about these methods with me. If you can't get there, uh, and you're talking nice to me, I might share my documentation for the course with about 200 papers. But what I teach there is number one, I teach the first thing you need to do is expand your horizon from this narrow uh, agile manifesto thinking of customer and user and get to the other 40 stakeholders who have values and qualities that need attending to. Okay. How many people here have a stakeholder analysis process? Right, a few, right? You're all sitting in the back, that's where I sit. Okay. And how many people believe in user stories and use cases and stuff like that? Uh, read my paper, what's wrong with user stories at agilerecord.com or I'll go to the website again. That's a primitive, childish world, which doesn't, the problem with user stories is, and I've talked with Mike Cohn about it, a good friend, uh, it doesn't cover quality. And he was asked on his blog uh, website, can we not integrate quality ideas into the user stories? And he said, yes, use Tom Gill's methods, plug them in. So it's not there, quality, in user stories. But it could be, but we have to change the culture. Um, number two, we need to learn to quantify, that is, make clear and testable all the different qualities that are important. This is a prerequisite for clear thinking about quality. Okay? We do it when we say, well, we want zero defects. Well, that's the beginning of quantifying that quality. But what about usability, security, maintainability, expandability, portability? Have you quantified all of those, if they are important? Because they are generally important. We talk about technical debt, but do we quantify how maintainable the system will be and engineer the maintainability of the system? See my paper on the website about engineering maintainability of the system. Okay, there's also an agilerecord.com uh, uh, column on exactly that subject, which is much shorter. Okay, so we need to learn to, this is the beginning of it being an engineer, or a clear, logical thing. We have to learn to quantify all those qualities which the people who are paying for our projects declare to be important. Maybe they can't quantify it, but if we're to be real engineers, they should be able to say user-friendly. We should be able to say, here are some numbers, is this what you need? And then if they say, yes, okay, then we will engineer this in, and we will somehow, and we will design it in, then we will test and measure that it is in. And we won't be testing for bugs, we will be testing for quality. Make sure it's there. Um, always get this. This just proves that I admit to see other than before. Anyway, uh, here's, okay, we now have three minutes left. Oh, what? Or, oh no, that's my own five minutes signal. Oh no. <laughs> I get three more, five minutes. Um, here's a real example of uh, something. One, one customer of mine who shall remain anonymous had a project that took eight years 
and spent $116 million. Big project. It totally failed to deliver anything. And I got the job of analyzing why. And I asked them, what are the top 10 things the men with the money were talking about on PowerPoint slides when the project was approved? And this is the list. Now take a look at that. They're all qualities, but they're not quantified. One exception, right? So what is this? Management bullshit. Read my paper on how to fight management bullshit on the website. Okay. Normal management bullshit. I brought this up with the CIO, and I said, I know why your projects fail. Nobody on the project had a clear idea of what the management wanted. So, but they happily spent $160 million on new technology, which delivered nothing. But they got paid. They had fun. They couldn't care less. No responsibility whatsoever. Uh, the, the CIO said, yeah, I also made that point eight years ago, but my boss, the CEO, said, we're in a hurry. We don't have time for that. Eight years ago, eight years. Eight years. Eight years. They didn't have time to spend one day, which is what I spent, on quantifying the top ten. So they wasted eight years. After the, another two years before, they finally got it delivered using my advice to get back on track. I got them back on an agile track, number one, and an engineering track. Then it took two years to change, turn the ship around. And, and 80, 90 people in China at that point when I met them. Okay. They started in Texas, by the way. <laughs> they eliminate one whole nationality from the project to try to save it, but even Chinese badly instructed don't do very good work. But they do it very fast. So uh, as an experiment, we, they have to think of you know, robustness. Wouldn't you like a robust system? Long story short, I said, one aspect of robustness is testability. And here is how I would quantify it in my planning language, language, which is in book. Okay, so you ever wondered how to quantify the testability of a system? How you can suggest it? It's a simple practical example. Really. Uh, here is, in one day, top 10 for a bank in London, quantified. Okay. These are bank qualities, trader qualities. This is fairly real. I've of course, doctor out of any confidential information, but that's how we do it. This is top 10 quantified in one day. This is how every project should begin, in my opinion. What are the 10 most critical things and make them clear and make them quantified and make this the foundation of the entire rest of the project. Everything else will waste eight years and $160 million every time. Three minutes. Uh, here's my idea of design. If this is the usability dimension, and this is the past level, say 35 minutes to do something, here's the new goal, seven times faster, five minutes, then design means finding something that will bridge this gap. And we call this different names, like architecture, design, strategies, solutions, technical ideas, or the means to the end. This is, this is the design phase that so few people in software engineering seem to understand at all. Certainly not in Agile. There's no clear concept of design whatsoever. I mean, asking the product owner to, or some people give you a user story, this is not design. Not in the engineering sense. This is something else. And this stuff, stuff that's nice to have, but that's not engineering. This is engineering. Um, one last thing. I have at least a minute or two, don't I? One minute. This one, uh, uh, this is, a, a, it's, a, I'm very proud that uh, uh, Intel, in uh, actually worldwide, in India, Portland, Oregon, they have adopted these methods for me for 10 years. They have currently trained 15,000 engineers voluntarily. It's not a standard you must do. The, the word is gone, this is a fair way of thinking for really smart Intel people in the worldwide competitive market. Okay. So they all do this, but they also use uh, my inspection method, my agile inspection method. So I thought this became publicized. So here they are. They're starting off with a requirements document for an Intel product, 31 pages. But they find there are 312 major defects. In other words, could be a bug in simple terms. That's a density of 10 defects per page. They swept their way through this and finally release a 45-page document with only 10 major defects at 0.22. In other words, 40 times better than a pretty damn good start. Okay. Result, well, productivity increased by 300%, defects reduced by 50%. That's a practical example of using the methods I teach people. Okay. 
and which you can get for free. Really love it. Some of you would pick it up. Some of my free courses. We held a free course yesterday here in Latvia, rather short notice. So I had seven people on the course having good fun. Maybe we'll do something like that later. Already been invited back for about a week. Uh, I'll come back. Thank you very much. <laughs>